I'm Gary C. Johnson. You've seen these billboards and ads that say size matters. I agree. The size that matters is the size of the results the law firm gets for their clients. We have several multi-million dollar verdicts here in Kentucky. In fact, our firm owns the record for the single largest personal injury verdict in the state of Kentucky. That's the size that matters to you. In Kentucky, give our firm the call. If you're hurt, injured, don't waste time. Gary Johnson cries for every dime. Welcome to Simply the Law of Life, a program created by attorney Gary C. Johnson. Simply the Law of Life provides free legal advice and encourages happiness and quality of life. Now, here's Simply the Law of Life with Gary C. Johnson and Keith Casebolt. Hello, everyone. Welcome into the radio program, Simply the Law of Life. I'm Keith Casebolt. Hello, dear friend, Gary C. Johnson. It's wonderful to be here, my friend. You know, I think the number one law law of life this year is to have fun and be successful and enjoy every moment we got because you and I were just talking and uh, just talking about everyday events and laughing and enjoying the fact that it's good to be alive. Well, just think about there's ups and downs. Going to come. Everybody has Some of my friends probably are having a few little downs right now. Right. I guarantee you someone's saying, wait a minute, you don't know what I'm going through. It's not real good right now. So don't, my friends that are in that situation, don't lose sight of the fact that you're alive. Don't lose sight of the fact that you can look around you and see things. Mm-hmm. That you can be aware of the fact that you're alive. How many times have I said, what would a tree give to know it was a tree? So you're much better off than that tree, folks. Yeah, I got, and I got to tell you something. Uh, you gave me a, a book for Christmas on human nature. I've got through the first four chapters so far of the book. You know what the first four chapters can be summed up into? Could be good, could be bad. Time will tell. When I got to the end of the fourth chapter on this human nature in life, I realized the only thing the author was saying was, Take your time and be patient because whatever's going on in your life that's bad could end up being good. And it will get over. It will change. There will be a change. Yeah. So, my friends, it's okay. It kind of keeps you balanced, doesn't it? If things are good in your life right now, don't get too excited. <laughs> and then, things just will change. Re- and then, then, really, if it's going to really bother you five years from now, I'd say really get upset about it today. And you know what the whole truth of that is? I hope to be here five years from now so that it can bother me. Except you won't remember it. Of course I won't. I'll be so happy that I'm here five years from now, I won't remember it. <laughs> it's the truth. I've been reading a little more in the John C. Maxwell book, The Difference Maker. I like that guy. He's, he is very, very smart. And he's got some, a section on attitude. So I'm going to read to you a little bit about attitude, folks. So does a good attitude make any difference? Absolutely. Attitude is the difference maker. Attitude isn't everything, but it is the one thing that can and will make the difference in your life. There is little difference in people, but the little difference makes a big difference. The little difference is attitude. The big difference is whether it is positive or negative. My friend, that is so true. You gave me a little test to do on that not long ago. You said whenever there's a day that you're dreading, if it involves a lot of travel or a lot of work, change your attitude and say, I can't wait to do this. I'm looking forward to everything that comes from it and see what happens. You were right. If you look at that project or that day and say, I'm going to do my best to learn and enjoy from it, you will end up having one of the best days you've ever had. <laughs> no matter how bad it's going. And that's the amazing thing about it. Yeah. I mean, if it's a 12 or 14 hour day, but you come away going, I enjoyed being there. <laughs> Dustin came into my office yesterday, Dustin Williams, that uh, really brilliant lawyer that works with me. And, uh, he said, oh, this has been a, a really bad day. I said, well, it looks to me like it's pretty good. He said, what do you mean? I said, well, you're alive. Yeah, you're still. <laughs> you made it through it. You're still here. 
Now, did all the problems officially go away? He said, well, yeah. I said, good. It's been a wonderful day, Dustin. <laughs> it is a wonderful day. That's right. Okay, this is what he says at, about attitude. What is an attitude anyway? When you hear the word, what do you think about? I think of attitude as an inward feeling expressed by outward behavior. Mm. People always project on the outside what they feel on the inside. Some people try to mask their attitude, and they can fool others for a little while. But that cover-up doesn't last long. Attitude always wiggles its way through and exposes itself. Boy, isn't that the truth. <laughs> Is it? I mean, how many times have people said, he's wearing his emotions on his shirt sleeve, or I can, I can see the real intent behind that. You think you're faking people out, but you're not. They can yeah. see it. Okay. Now, my father loves to tell the story of a four-year-old boy who was finally put into timeout after battling his mother. Sit in that chair until the timer goes off, the mother said in frustration. The boy sat down, fearing greater punishment, but said, Okay, Mommy, I'm sitting on the outside, but I'm standing up on the inside. (laughs) (laughs) Still rebellious to the end. That's right. He was going to sit down, but he was still inside. He was standing up. (laughs) Your attitude colors every aspect of your life. It is like the mind's paintbrush. It can paint everything in bright, vibrant colors, creating a masterpiece. Or it can make everything dark and dreary. Attitude is so pervasive and important that I've come to think of it as the most important thing in our life. There's not a single part of your current life that is not affected by your attitude. And your fortune, will, future will definitely be influenced by the attitude you carry with you from today forward. Now, all my friends, they're going to have a wonderful attitude from today forward. You know, if everybody just did it as a test for today, no matter what you got on your schedule, if you just did what Gary's saying and you said, I'm going to be positive about this no matter what, I'd love to see what comes from it. Then he goes on to say this. If your attitude is so important, then you may be asking yourself, where did I get it? Am I stuck with it my whole life, for better or worse? First, let's look at the question of where your attitude comes from. Number one, personality. Hmm. Who are you? Two men were out fishing. When the fish stopped biting, they started to talk. One man praised his wife and extolled her many virtues, summing it up by saying, You know, if all men were like me, they would all want to be married to my wife. And if they were like me, the other replied, none of them would want to be. (laughs) Isn't that the truth? (laughs) I think that's funny. Everybody's different. Each person is born a unique individual. We're all as different as our fingerprints. That's true even of siblings born of the same parents and brought up in the same household and treated the same way. Even twins who are genetically identical have distinct personalities. Your personality type, your natural wiring, impacts your attitude. That is not to say you're trapped by your personality, because you're not, but your attitude is certainly impacted by it. Well, now, all right, that's a good question. You just talked about the twins, because some of our people may be saying, wait a minute, you mean my DNA, my my makeup has made me an unhappy person? How do I get out of this? Because that's the way I was born. He's saying that's not true. Your natural worry impacts your attitude, but it doesn't control it. In other words, you can change it. That's right. You can fix it. But you've got to be aware. It's always, let's think about it. On everything we talk about on this program is being aware. Mm -hmm. Every year that we've ever done this program, it's about being aware, looking around you. Think. Question everything. Consider. Yeah. So we all know somebody that's walking down the aisle that we see, and we can't wait to see them because they're always smiling. They make us happier. Mm -hmm. And then there's that other person that's coming that we're going, oh, no, and we try to dodge them. You're saying the question is, which one of those people are we? 
Mm-hmm. Are we the person that somebody's trying to dodge, or are we the person that somebody's gladly walking up and up to and saying, oh, it's so good to see you? So the number one on where you got your attitude was personality. We just read about it. Right. Number two is environment. What's around you? The environment you were exposed to growing up definitely has an impact on your attitude. Did your parents go through a divorce? That may cause you to have a mistrustful attitude toward members of the opposite sex. Did someone close to you die? That may prompt you to have an attitude of emotional distancing from others. Did you grow up in a poor neighborhood? That may prompt you to have a tenacious attitude toward achievement. In contrast, it could make you want to give up more easily. It could actually shape your attitude. It may be hard to predict exactly what will happen to a person's attitude based on his or her early environment, but you can be certain that it made an impact of some kind. Wow, that's actually, uh, in the Human Nature book over here, there was a chapter on that that said some of the reasons that you're unhappy with people or things in your life relate to your childhood experiences. And you've got to go back and say, why am I acting this way or reacting this way? Did something happen into my childhood? And this author is saying, more than likely, that's the case. Again, he's looking at where where does your attitude come from? Mm -hmm. Why are you negative all the time? Well, maybe it's because you were trained as you grew up to be negative. We are creatures of habit, right? <clears throat> so you're saying if we're around three or four family members and they're all negative, we're probably going to be negative. There is no way you can be otherwise. You will ado- adapt to what that is. Mm-hmm. Okay? Number three, on what, where you get your attitude from, the expression of others, what you feel. Most people can remember the harsh words of a parent or teacher even years or decades after the fact. Some people carry the scars of such experiences their entire lives. In my book, Winning with People, the pain principle states, hurting people hurt people and are easily hurt by them. Many times the hurts that cause people to overreact to others come as a result of negative words from others that they have experienced in their lifetime. So that works both ways, because I've heard you on this program talk with so much affection about some of your teachers who encouraged you or gave you a kind word from grade school. You've carried that with you. It meant that much to you. So you're saying the same thing. Someone who said something hurtful or damning to you, you carried that with you also. Then he goes on to say, on the other hand, Positive words can have an impact on a person's attitude. Can you remember the positive words of a favorite teacher or other significant adult? A few words can change the way a person thinks of himself and can change the course of his or her life. Think about that. Just a few words. How many times have we talked about how powerful words are? (laughs) And how one of the four agreements is try to be impeccable with the word? That's what he's talking about. One of the greatest lessons that you ever taught me. A broken bone will heal. A busted nose will heal. The worst fight you got into with your friend, all the wounds heal. But if they said something bad to you, you will carry that insult with you for 50 years. And think about it. It's not physical or any of the psychological part of us. It's not physical at all. But it's a more severe pain. Ten times. Where's it come from? Hmm? I always thought about that. Okay, number four on where your attitude comes from is self-image. How do you see yourself? How you see yourself has a tremendous impact on your attitude. Poor self-image and poor attitudes often walk together hand in hand. It's hard to see anything in the world as positive if you continuously see yourself as negative. Now, how many times have we discussed that? Huh? More than I care to admit because you, my friend, pointed out to me, you said, Keith, do you notice that you have a habit of putting yourself down or you have a habit of saying nasty things to yourself? And I said, are you sure? And then I caught myself, and you're right. It was, it was me saying derogatory things to me. And your subconscious records those when you say them. And believes them. And believes them. Then it becomes who you are. 
even if you think you're kidding. So or my joking. friends, never say anything negative about yourself, even in jest. Even if you're telling a joke in front of friends and you're That's putting a, yourself down, don't do it. You're doing damage because you're, you're going to record it. You're recording it in your subconscious, and the subconscious doesn't know it was in jest. So your self-image is critical if you're going to succeed in life and be happy. And remember, this year is about success. We're laying some groundwork for success. We're talking about attitude and the things, self-image, the things that will lead, my friends, to all be successful this year. Right? Yeah. I'm on board. Number five on that, where your attitude comes from, son. Exposure to growth opportunities, what you've experienced in life. Enlightenment writer and philosopher Voltaire likened life to a game of cards. Players must accept the cards dealt to them. However, once they have those cards in hand, they alone choose how they will play them. They decide what risk and what actions to take. The growth opportunities people experience are not all equal. Period. No, I, I 100% agree. So, you take the cards you're dealt, and you play them, and you make choices. But those experiences around you, if you could elaborate on that a little bit, because we all have people around us that can be mentors, that we can learn from, if we will listen and if we will ask the questions. And we also, in life, have people around us that can have negative influences on us. Just the opposite, yes. And I want to read you about what he has to say about that, okay? Association. Who are you hanging out with? Mm -hmm. That's his next question. Um, all the time you hear about young people in trouble who are said to have been nice kids who ended up hanging with the wrong crowd. It's a fact that you start becoming like the people you spend a lot of time with. If a nice kid spends all of his time with people with, of low moral character, it's only a matter of time before he begins to display low moral character. Likewise, if someone with a good attitude spends all of her time with individuals who display negative attitudes, guess what will happen to her? She'll begin to develop and will have a negative attitude. She may think she can change them, but if she's outnumbered and gets no relief from their negativity, they are the ones who will, in the end, do the influencing, not her. Gary, is it really as simple as that? The old saying, a, a rising tide lifts all ships. I mean, is it really as simple that if you, if you associate with good moral people, upstanding people, successful people, that you yourself will be that? And the opposite is, if you associate with the opposite, low moral, unsuccessful people, that you will fall into that with them? You will be that. And my friends are not going to do that. It takes over without you even knowing. That's, that's and I like, the, I like the part you read, that if you think you can save them, you're wrong. <laughs> the group will take over you. You won't take over the group. The last sentence, they will be the ones who will be doing the influencing, not you. That's pretty powerful. That is powerful. The number seven on how poor your attitude comes from is beliefs. What do you think? Many of the factors I've mentioned have come together to shape your attitude were set in motion in your past. But do you know what forms and, and sustains your attitude most today? Your thoughts. Oh, boy. Oh, we we delved into that for about a year. And this is what he says about thoughts. He had a little poem. I can make you rise or fall. I can work for you or against you. I can make you a success or a failure. I control the way you feel and the way you act. I can make you laugh, work, love. I can make your heart sing with joy, excitement, elation. Or I can make you wretched, dejected, and morbid. I can make you sick and listless. I can be a shackle, heavy, attached, burdensome. Or I can be a the prism's hue, dancing, bright, fleeting, lost, for, lost forever, captured by pen or purpose. I can be nurtured, grown, 
and being great and beautiful, seen by the eyes of others through actions in you. I can never be removed, only replaced. I am a thought. You know, the funniest thing I think that you've ever told me that's turned out to be true was when you were taking your walks and you said that thought or that inner voice would say, Gary, let's just sit here in the chair. Let's don't go. It's too cold outside. And you said you'd get up and you'd go out and you'd walk and you'd, you told me as soon as you got back, that inner voice said, aren't you glad we did that? Don't you feel better? And I'm like, damn, this thing wins no matter what. It's your thoughts. And how many of my friends just recently didn't do some exercise or something you should have done for yourself that you put off and you procrastinated? Mm -hmm. It's so easy to do, and it's so easy to talk yourself into it. So the next time you get in that position, you ask that thought that's telling you not to do it, you say, okay, thought in our brain, who are we cheating by not doing this? Let's define who's getting cheated but not exercising. And then look and see after the walk, as soon as you're done and you're drinking your bottle of water and you're toweling mm -hmm. off, see if that voice and that thought doesn't come back and go, boy, that feels great. We're getting in shape. We need to do this every day. And we didn't cheat ourselves. Because the only person when you're not doing these things for yourself that you're cheating, my friends, is you. Yeah, 100%. Now, surely you don't want to be a cheater, do you? Huh? And if you do, you don't want it to be yourself. That's that you're right. Cheating. You know, uh, you, can, you could live eat a whole lot easier with cheating somebody else than you can yourself, trust me. You'll live a whole lot longer if you don't cheat yourself. You know, this at times sounds so simple, but at other times this can be so complicated. Every thought you have shapes your life. Yeah. What you think about your neighbor is your attitude toward him. The way you think about your job is your attitude toward work. I just think that's so powerful and it's so true what he's saying. The number eight is choices. How many times have we talked about choices, huh? Oh, Lord, yeah. Poet, critic, and dictionary writer Samuel Johnson observed, he who has so little knowledge of human nature as to seek happiness by changing anything but his own disposition, will waste his life in fruitless efforts and multiply the grief which he pro proposes to remove. Now think about that. Yeah. He's saying simply, you can change yourself and your disposition, but you can't change anybody else's. Most people want to change the world to improve their lives, but the world they need to change first is the one inside themselves. That is a choice, one that some are not willing to make. You know, I was talking to a young man the other day, and Gary and I are recording uh, uh, in the studio in Pikeville for this radio show. We normally have, do the television in Lexington, but in Pikeville, I was talking to a young man that said, you know, i got to get out of this town. You can't make it in a small town, and there's nothing to do here. And I said, you know, that's strange, because my good friend Gary Johnson said he's traveled all over the world, and he enjoys the town of Pikeville better than any place in the world. And there's so many opportunities. And I was thinking as you were reading, here's a young man that sees everything negative with no possibilities <laughs> or opportunities. And here you've described the small town as a wonderful place to where you can be or do anything. Eastern Kentucky is the land of milk and honey. So people are saying, I guarantee you somebody knows of a couple in Lexington that one is saying, oh, this is too small for me, i got to go bigger. And other people are saying, this is the greatest town, the same thing in Hazard, Louisville, Bowling Green, anywhere in the state, or maybe the state of Kentucky. You remember that parable, Keith? A person comes up to the old man sitting outside the city, I, I yeah, get it right. Yeah, the gas station. And ask him, how are the people in this town? And the old man asked him, he says, well, how were they from where you came? Oh, they were terrible, they were ruthless, they were bitter, they were mean, and blah, blah, blah. <laughs> the old fellow said, well, that's exactly what you'll find in this town. Next guy comes along and asks him about, well, how are the people in this town? Same town. The guy says, oh, they were wonderful. They were bright, they were smiling, they were good, decent human beings. The old fellow says to him, 
That's, how, that's what you'll find these two people and, to be. And it's the truth. So, yeah. So anybody that's saying, I've got to get out of here and get to a place where things are good, you're saying to them, the place you're going is not going to change it. You're going to have to change yourself. You are the place. You are, you are the place. That's right. Simply. Whether you're in Los Angeles, you're in Lexington, wherever you're at, you're the place. Then he continues a little bit more about the choices. Early in life, you don't have many choices. You don't choose where you were born. You don't choose your parents. You don't choose your race, your personality type, or your genetic makeup. You don't choose your health. Everything you are and nearly everything you do is not up to you in your early life. You must live with the conditions you find yourself in. As Voltaire would say, you start with the cards you're dealt. But the longer you live, the more your life is shaped only by your choices, which you can now control. Wow. Hmm? That's a lot of accountability. Yeah. So from childhood, you're right. What you eat, what you drink, how you're clothed, where you go to school, all those choices are made for you. And then all of a sudden... The person that makes the choices is little old you. <laughs> but you want to complain that other people are controlling your future, your happiness, your success, and you're saying, now the buck stops with you now. You're the person in you're control. You're the one that gets to make the choices. You can dress the way you want, eat what you want, go to school where you want, work where you want. And just remember, all my friends are unique. I'm finding of, out that One of more. a kind. You're finding that out more and more, right, Keith? I am indeed. I and am indeed. Now, aren't you starting to see lots of talent that you never recognized before in my friends out there? Huh? Listen, I, I, am, I am in awe of what people can do. <laughs> it's amazing. That I can't do. And my friends, because of that, if you can control your attitude and you can change your attitude, you can become anything you want to be. You can truly be successful. That's our goal this year. Each and every one of my friends has listened to this program. Their responsibility is to be successful this year. And it starts with the attitude. And it starts with the attitude. Great lesson, my friend. If you would like to get in touch with Gary C. Johnson, you can do that. It's Gary at GaryCJohnson.com. Uh, of course, Gary's a plaintiff lawyer, so if you've had an injury or you need his help, you can contact him, Gary, at GaryCJohnson.com. My friend, this is a good lesson for us this week. Attitude. Uh, success. And mm. it's going to be cold, so what a great opportunity to wear that new coat you got for Christmas. Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> On behalf of Gary C. Johnson, I'm Keith Casebolt. Thank you so much for tuning in to Simply the Law of Life. Gary and I look forward to seeing you again next week, right here at this same time. Thank you for listening to Simply the Law of Life, a program created by attorney Gary C. Johnson. Until next week, may you be safe, blessed, and happy. If you're hurt, injured, don't waste time. Gary Johnson cries for every dime.